Welcome to the Knock on Archery podcast, where we bring all archers and bow hunters together from all walks of life with the goal to educate, empower, and inspire you to be better both in the field and on the range. Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome. Oh, nice, Darren. <laughs> hey, that's that's podcasting 2023. That's how it goes. Uh, I've got uh, none other than <laughs> the Ron Burgundy of the hunting world, dude. How much mahogany is in that office right there? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's nothing, dude. You should see. <laughs> oh, God. Straight up. Cabinets and... <laughs> oh, my yeah, goodness. It's... Yeah. <laughs> Only the best. <laughs> for so, leather, the whole nine yards, man. <laughs> for any of you listening, this is uh, Darren Cooper, one of one of my OG tuning buddies and one of my OG hunting buddies, uh, Darren and I actually started our very first hunting DVD pre knock on, uh, DD bow hunting. And yeah. we were kind of the, honestly, it seems like we were one of the first that started to bring a little bit of tuning and, and education into the DVD world back when no one, you know, it was kind of like cookie cutter monster bucks by everybody. And, and, uh, yeah, I'm going to give you a little lead in Darren. So Darren, uh, was an engineer at Hoyt. How long? Um, well, 10 years Yeah, roughly 10 years, just shy of that, but internally, and then you still consulted for Zach and, and Randy pro it, still. Yeah. Yeah. I still do a little, I mean, Zach and I are really close. So uh, we do a lot of hunting together and I get to look at the bows and spend some time on them and and uh, you know, give my two cents. And currently so, you're pretty much a, I'm going to say a nuclear engineer. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> not, not really. Uh, <laughs> I'd have to kill you. No, um, no, I've, I've gosh, I've done kind of all kinds of engineering, but um, I'm actually working for my father-in-law's company doing electrical work, but we did uh, work on a big nuclear facility. Um, <laughs> probably last time I was, you and I were talking, but, um, yeah. So doing a lot of project management type stuff and, uh, yeah, still doing a little consulting work in the archer world, but, uh, yeah. Darren was, uh, Darren and Jason Fogg were both behind the original cam and a half system that came out by Hoyt, which was, you know, a huge, probably, um, I think that's when Hoyt kind of, you know, stepped kind of moved forward to Matthews during that era you know there for a time and certainly your cam systems your cam systems really changed the hoyt platforms because what i tell people is people ask me all the time like what the difference is between the bows and i honestly feel like the main difference between the bows is the headspace of the engineers because most of the engineers at hoyt you guys were all competitors. We all competed together. We were yeah. long range tacticians and you got, you know, we were all trying to chase, you know, speed with heavier arrows for our tournaments and that sort of thing. Uh, obviously Hoyt's always had just a vicious, uh, target archery, you know, specifically long range target archery. I think Hoyt definitely has, uh, probably the biggest group of shooters, but I tell people sure. Hoyt's engineers, you guys were very involved with that game. I mean, the Hoyt engineers went to Reading every year. You guys went to FIDAs, you went overseas, you guys worked with teams. Um, but then like with Matthews, it was more like Matt was, you know, he's very, very different in how he engineers and like how he even looks at like bow tuning and what he demands from the bow tuning. He's very much a, a feel yeah. person, whereas you guys mm -hmm. were very much performance oriented. And then I think PSE sure. was always, PSE was always pushing the, pushing the speed limit. I would tell people, I think, you know, I guess if I was to describe PSE, they were always going after, you know, the freaking rocket ships. Right. So I feel yeah. like that's kind of the big difference. How do you see it? Um, I think that's similar, you know, I mean, um, aside from just the tournament archery stuff that, uh, you know, our engineering crew had going on, um, there was a lot of passionate bow hunters around too. And that, that really helped drive things. Um, 
you know, aside from the tournament shooting, you know, we're packing these things around the, the elk mountains, um, the Wasatch front specifically, yeah, the Wasatch front, you know, hunt, you know, hunting stuff, you know, definitely pounding the Wasatch, but, um, you know, just hunting the West in general. And so I think that lends a little different flavor to, to your bow designs, you know? So we, yeah. we tended to be a little bit longer making stuff, maybe a little more shootable where Matthew's, and some of the Eastern bow companies, you know, we're focused a little more on, on the tree stand designs and where maybe, you know, ultimate accuracy wasn't as critical on those hunting bows, you know, but maneuverability and, um, you know, being able to shoot out of a tree stand was a little more focused. So there was a, you know, that's always going to color, um, your design a little bit, just depending on where you're hunting. Plus several of us, um, there's been a few engineers that have kind of shifted from one company to another. And then as I think as knowledgeable shooters switch to that direction mm -hmm. switches, like for example, um, you know, when I, when I went back to PSE and I'm there with, you know, someone like Chris white or Dave cousins, if they're given feedback, I mean, that feedback is as solid as it gets, you know, um, definitely. And those were people that at one time that were, you know, external people giving feedback at Hoyt, right? You know, that was kind yeah. of in all of our eras at that time. And, and we had a, you know, a lot of us had really good tight relationships with the, the shooting crowd because we were there day in, day out, you know, competing with them, against them, all that stuff. And so, um, you know, I felt like that flow of information was, you know, as good as anywhere and probably the best in the industry at the time. Um, just because we were so in deep, you know, traveling with, with these guys. And, um, you were certainly doing that for, for Matthews, you know, um, but I, you know, when you came over to our side and, and, uh, we had you and, you know, cousins and, you know, a lot of these guys that we just constantly had these dialogues with, had them come out or we, you know, spend a lot of time with them on, you know, different circuits and stuff. It was awesome. I think it really helped, um, elevate the brand and the equipment and, no, it was it was a good time. So I have a few questions for you. We have not like FYI, we have not like prepped or anything for this podcast. I just called Darren and said, Hey dude, let's get on and talk shop. So yeah. Um and I I value your opinion. I don't know if you saw I did a park uh podcast the other day with James Park and James is um Sometimes when people are that smart, I know some people are saying, I'd like to hear James talk more. Um, there's certain people that are on a, on a level where you, you kind of have to ask and receive that you have to like <laughs> lead. Um, yeah. Darren's not that person. Uh, Darren is one of the ones that always is, uh, easily communicative at the party. <laughs> <laughs> Just lubricate uh, <laughs> my mouth with a few beers and <laughs> let's go. <laughs> there he is. You you guys are getting them right there. Um, so my question is, like, from a engineering point of view, how how maxed out are we in the industry from efficiency on compound bows right now? There's very little that's left, man. Um, that's I mean, we've been maxed out for a long time and they keep eking, you know, I mean, ringing that and ringing it you know, <laughs> just a little bit more performance out of it. But, um, you know, from an efficiency stand standpoint, you know, we're over 85, 86%. And for mechanical systems, that's almost unheard of. Um, so there's still some energy there that, you know, to be converted, but I don't know. I mean, there's some of it has to, you know, be dissipated in the form of diaper, uh, vibration and noise, which, you know, is still getting better and better. Um, bows are still getting quieter. Um, it's amazing, you know, how far they've come even in the last five years, but as far as speeds and energy stored, they haven't changed dramatically over the last 10 years. You know, I mean, we've been pretty well topped out. There's, you know, they've eked a little bit more performance out of these cams while making them still, uh, shootable, but, you know, um, it's going to take, you know, a, a new mechanical system in order to really drive performance much higher than, than where we're at now. Yeah. We either need like a totally different type of like limb composite, or we need like, you know, honestly, just the, 
a two wheeled compound bow system as we know it, that almost needs to change, right? To where yeah, all of a sudden, like yeah. a third wheel gets figured out somewhere that we'd, is. Storing. We'd have to store more energy with basically a you know pump it up type of yeah. deal where you could where you <laughs> Dude, could you power know, line store a couple... BB gun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got in so much trouble with that sucker once I had that <laughs> ten pump instead of my freaking Red Rider. <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah me too yeah. it's but that's that's what it's going to take you know you're going to have to store um an additional you know uh energy cycle because we're we're limited by what we can draw comfortably that's all the energy storage that we have unless we can figure out a way to multiply that or, or tack onto it and then not not um get excluded by you know laws and whatnot you know i mean at that point aren't i mean you're kind of a crossbow if you start storing more energy than you, than you put in with the initial draw, then, you know, that's, that's crossbow land and, and, um, you know, your definition gets pretty fuzzy. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and talk to people a little bit more. Um, so whenever we're talking like a new, like all of a sudden a new company comes out with speed and they're five feet per second faster, essentially, you have at this point because our efficiency is maxed out and you know from like an engineering point of view like what aaron uh what darren's saying is uh there's not there's not more that we can get out of it but what we're doing is you know from a consumer point of view you're getting marketed to in one form or another by robbing peter to pay paul it's like you can take you can take an RX seven and you can make it faster, but if you're going to do that, you're going to have to put smaller servings on. You're going to have to go to two or four strands less in the string. Like Short you're going to, yeah, you're yeah. going to have to come up with a cam that's you know the the cam isn't as far off the axle. It comes in more to where now you've got more yeah. power stroke on there. But whenever we're talking like five feet a second, that five feet a second is going to be relative to you know weight in the string or it's going to be relative to power stroke um yeah. to where you know it's either we're either going to have to take a half inch to get a five feet or we're going to have to minimize weight in the center of the string to gain that speed too so right. what do you think i mean do you think where companies are sending a bow out of the factory right now do you think they're really in the best place for the consumer's point of view or do you think there's something um, we're doing right now that maybe we shouldn't be doing or something a consumer should change to where they're, they're able to maximize what they're getting out of their systems. Well, personally, I think bows have gotten too short, man. Um, in a lot of cases, I, I long for the longer bows and I know when every single time that I play with, you know, a, a 34 versus a 31 and I'm, especially when I get the 31 first and I'm like, at first it's a little, you know, all right, I'm, I'm shooting it pretty good. And then you get used to it and you start shooting it really good. You're like, this thing's just as good as, as my longbow. And then I pick up my longbow again and it's like, it's impossible to miss with this. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, so I, I do feel like those longer bows are still more forgiving. They're easier to shoot. Um, you know, they're easier to shoot tight groups with. Um, however, you know, they're also, you, you may not need that for the hunting that you're doing. And maybe that maneuverability and that short bow is, is better for you. So I do feel like we've sacrificed in, in some, in some ways shootability, but it's also, you know, the purpose built for, you know, shooting out of ground blinds and shooting out of tree stands. It's a heck of a lot easier to, you know, maneuver a, you know, a 31 inch or a 30 inch bow, you know, I mean, some companies are building them, you know, substantially shorter than that. You know, that's not something I'm going to shoot, but I'm also primarily hunting out West and, and where that, you know, that typical shot for me is probably going to be 45 yards. And yeah, I was going to say oftentimes, yards. you know, yeah. 70 is, is, you know, that's like my favorite distance because nothing reacts. They just stand there and take it. Yeah. So if I got a 70 yard shot at something, I'm, I'm sending that all day long and, and yeah, I need a yeah. little longer, more forgiving bow that's going to aim good and, you know, that I have a ton of confidence in. So, yeah, I think we've both seen those shots <laughs> <laughs> a few times. from an, from an over the shoulder, uh, <laughs> point of view. Okay. So with that said, um, and I certainly agree. I think, I think East of the Mississippi, you know, when you're, 
hunting Midwest stuff, when your, your bow's in and out of your vehicle a lot more, when it's, you know, when you're humping it up, a, you know, you're hoisting it up a tree and down, you're putting it on a bow hanger, that more compact design and something that, you know, if you know, as a bow hunter, you're mid range or less, whereas, you know, a Western hunter, depending on the style of hunting, they know that, you know, if, if you've got this scale of close range and long range, most Midwest, east of the Mississippi, most everybody like this is their, this is their, their kill opportunity for the year. Most likely it's like, it's going to be this close or, you know, from here to here is kind of, yeah. like, you know, especially in the timber, you know, you, you're limited on how far you can shoot. Whereas I yeah, feel like can't you know, see the top of my hat's like the furthest shooting. I feel like the, the Western hunters are more like right here is like their window of opportunity. So there's like a small crossover between the upper end of that longest shot in the Midwest. That would be the lower end of the Western hunters in a lot of situations, you know, yeah. unless it's an elk hunter, the elk are bugling, they're screaming, you're in thick, dark timber where that's yeah, going to be a 20 can, yard shot. Right. Definitely. Definitely can get some close opportunities at elk, but, and it just depends on where you're at too. North Idaho is a heck of a lot different than Arizona, you know, but it, it, you can, you can get into tight situations with just about any species, but it's not the norm. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Can people, and I say this because I talked to someone um, that I trust a lot and I'm hoping to, I'm hoping he's going to come on the podcast. Um, well, it's Joel. Uh, yeah. So, cool. uh, so what he's saying, and you know, this kind of comes from Matt and Gary Simons as well, but, there's a point where you can choose an arrow that it, it starts to diminish the actual efficiency of the bow system. Once an arrow becomes, I guess, overboard. I mean, yeah, for sure. Okay. So, so, so from a engineering point of view, um, tell me like, because here, here's why I've been on, I've been on a bit of an arrow bender. Yeah. Um, and this all boils down to, I love it when I'm at a tack event and I'm interacting with people. And the one thing I don't remember a lot, I don't remember like people's names. I don't remember stuff like that, but what I'm plagued with is remembering people's techniques and remembering like when I see their equipment, how it's set up, like that's just part of my, what my brain grasps, even though it should yeah. be like, what's this person's name? And you know, you saw him yesterday, but you already forgot. But like, when I see the bow, I'm like, oh yeah, I know you. <laughs> so there right. was a lot of, um, there was just so many people that came up with an arrow that just looked like overkill. And then as soon as I watched their arrow flight, the same thing, dude, let me show you that this isn't, this is the craziest photo I think I've ever got there. there someone rolled up with like 700 grain arrow. Oh man. And uh <laughs> and shot it out of a Hoyt. They had their limbs backed out a little bit. <laughs> wow. Is that the craziest? That's nuts. I mean, I've obviously we've seen frames where you can see where the strings ahead of the bottom. Yeah. But like part of me feels like, you know, when you're trying to to thrust something that's too heavy to like get going, especially on some of these bows that maybe have like weaker string tensions is this possible to where literally the cams are like trying to push something that's just too heavy for the system or i don't think it's too heavy but i think you have other dynamics going on you know with when your foc gets way out of whack and um you know the system's gonna work but there's a uh, a point where unless you're shooting a super heavy bow, you know, and, and plan on going to Africa or something, there's just no need for that kind of mass weight. It's going to be good and quiet, but um, you're going to sacrifice so much performance or trajectory, um, you know, and then your efficiency is going to level out to, you know, by the time you get to, you know, about probably seven and a half to eight grains per pound, that efficiency is going to level out and, really not 
be getting any better because there's still that that limit of mechanical efficiency that we have with bows. You're just not going to get above, you know, probably 86 and a half percent, no matter how heavy of an arrow that you put in there, just because the bows have gotten better. It's kind of decreased that gap of, you know, what you could gain from an efficiency standpoint with a heavy arrow versus a light arrow. That's that gap's not there anymore. I mean, yeah. shooting so efficient with a, you know, with five grains per pound that, um, you just there's not much to be gained in terms of, of noise or you know efficiency and, and, and getting more energy out of the back end when you shoot that arrow see i feel like i feel like people's um this is just my personal opinion i made a post today it's a totally loaded question and i love the people that are just <laughs> like like people are posting like the star wars dude going it's a trap because <laughs> did you see what i posted i didn't see it yet hold on <laughs> hold on i'll show you so this is funny because our podcast will launch not not soon after this so my question was someone gets to hit you one time with one of these two things which of the two would you choose if they only get one strike <laughs> uh yeah i know what i'd pick but <laughs> Dude, I'm gonna let someone just hit me one time with a freaking knife. If it's through and through, like I'm yeah. but if someone freaking slams a hatchet into my sternum and walks away and it's even if it's in there three inches, I'm gonna be like, I'm not wiping this one off and there's no rags yeah. around to put in this thing. For sure. So what uh I haven't talked to you in a long time, so I think this is very fair. You know, I don't mm -hmm. know if there's any uh, extreme FOC people out there. I don't know what Darren's shooting, so this is someone that I really, really value his opinion. And if I was ever stumped on something from a engineering or tuning aspect, a hundred percent, like Darren or Zach, Joel or Matt are going to be four of the people that I would ask. Um, so what is your arrow build right now? Um, I am using the FMJ injection 340 uh, with titanium and 100 grain broadhead. Oh, and you're shooting what poundage? You're shooting RX-7? Uh, yeah, RX-7. Um, running <laughs> about 72 pounds. You're um, like, all right, yeah. <laughs> Let yeah. me call it a 7. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll just say it's an rx7 yeah <laughs> um about 72 to 73 pounds typically although i'm rehabbing a shoulder right now i me too <laughs> uh, wrecked my dirt bike a couple i guess it's been about a month ago and dislocated my shoulder and i have a, a an elk tag that i've been waiting 25 years for so that opens august 23rd and it's what august 4th this morning so yeah don't working hard at it i was rehabbing the shoulder this morning so <laughs> it's uh it's healing really good but it's you know it could hurry up I yeah better. yeah all so right so what's your speed and everything um running around probably you know i haven't shot it through graph lately but it's probably i haven't shot that bow at all lately to be honest but probably around that 285 286 287 i'm a 29 inch draw the and it's zone. a 520 grain arrow total weight. bam yeah i'm definitely not telling people to not have a heavy arrow like but to me there's like a, like when i was showing you guys earlier you know there's a there's a graph there should be a graph on arrow weights and you know i think the way that that graph you know I guess it's hard because we all have different poundages and different draw lengths and we choose different bow models and different cam cycles. But, you know, I think there's like light arrows, there's middle of the road arrows, and then there's extreme. And, yeah. you know, for me, unless I was building a hundred pound bow or a 90 or a hundred pound bow at Matthews for someone going to Africa for any of the big five or, you know, or if it was someone that had a 27 inch draw and they're going for, you know, a bison or something like that, then yeah, they're a hundred percent. You know, I feel like some of that projectile information matches that, right. It like matches mm -hmm. that gear. It's perfect for, for sure. it. Um, but I feel like right now the industry is divided on a topic that quite frankly, the freaking bows we're shooting right now is like 
I mean, it's so far advanced from what we were all perfectly fine with in early 2000s. And honestly, early 2000s, freaking brass inserts didn't even exist, dude. I remember when we got the first ones made, you know, for the Axis and the FMJs. And I remember hiring that same machine shop to machine me brass for my ACCs. Yeah. You know, I was running set screws in the back of my inserts because brass didn't exist so. right right yeah. and so I would tap them out and run set screws in the back so i could get 50 grains right so what um do you shoot collars over yours right now over do you shoot the collared system over the four millimeter no um that outsert that i'm shooting kind of tapers out and so right. it matches my broadhead you know diameter i'm trying to think so does it have a, a shank bigger. yeah Is it's it got a shank shank with a slight cap or no cap i don't think it caps over the end of the the shaft to you know keep it from mushrooming out the, okay it's not a bap insert it's the it's the easton titanium one but i don't think they so you can actually shoot into a bag target and it pulls out and it's not pink sock oh, yeah. in your yeah, bag nice. target prolapse <laughs> in your bag target <laughs> no no they pull good so but you do have to use the right size feel points and stuff or it's yeah it's a bitch so when you got, when you were at, uh, you, do you still work with Eastman's? Eastman's bow hunting? Yeah. The magazine? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. not, not anymore, but yeah, I did for quite a while. Right. So, I mean, you've, you've been in company with, well, probably more engineers than me, especially with the, with the Hoyt team. Are there any Hoyt engineers right now that are extreme FOC fans? Not that I'm aware of. Um, you know, I haven't talked to those guys specifically about that, but, um, yeah, not that I'm aware of. Zach certainly isn't. He hasn't mentioned anything to me. Um, right. Yeah, most of those guys are, are running middle of the road stuff. And, you know, I know what has worked for me time over time over time, you know, testing and, and stuff. And there's a, there's a pretty, and I don't even, I don't even measure the FOC, John. It's just a, it's just a combined point weight that works that, so you know. i don't measure mine either i've actually measured um i actually have made a few posts of some of my targets that i've shot in competitions and then i just kind of put like this target was brought to you by a 10.9 percent foc <laughs> uh you know because i like i still have most of my arrows that i've meddled with you know so yeah I've, you can measure you can go figure it out. out yeah i can now granted they're not slinging broadheads but the truth is what I've always sought on my personal <clears throat> hunting bow, I've always sought accuracy with the field points. And then I find a broadhead that works with that projectile yeah. that's given me these, the absolute best results out of my bow. When that happens, then I personally have chose a projectile to go with it. I've never like said, I'm going to literally rearrange my entire bow and arrow configuration because I want to shoot this two inch fixed blade head. Like I've never, <laughs> I've never personally done that, you know, because, and I've never been, I've actually never been mentally directed towards pass through either. Like I, I want trauma. I want a hole that nobody can close up like not someone with yeah. hooves you know something <laughs> something with hooves or paws i don't want them to be able to close it up so right. i mean that that's just me i've always chased the accuracy and i found you know because that's what we did with our bows as target archers right we would sure. try this spine this spine this spine find the spine that worked then tweak with your tiller to see if you could even like get it tighter and then mm. maybe play with the projectiles to see like what's got more drag, you know, what's opening that thing back up down range or what's keeping it tight all the way from the front to the back. And right. then from there, I'm like, okay, well, this thing shoots lights out. Like I'm shooting a target bow right now. I'm literally hunting with the target bow. And then I think yeah. with broadhead technology right now, dude, there's a lot of companies making broadheads that are really freaking accurate and reliable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. What are you shooting? Um, right now, I am shooting. I've been shooting the Rage Hypodermics, but I just recently switched to the Severs. Okay. Um, you know, good shooting, broadhead, super deadly. Um, I 
was shooting the the hypodermics, they're probably not quite as accurate as the sever. Right. Um, but they're, you know, they're freaking deadly. Yeah. So. Yeah. And for that, I mean, there's a trade off. I feel like, I feel like with my tripans, I can out penetrate a, a, I feel like I could out penetrate a sever, mm -hmm. but there's also, there's been some times where I've been in some thick stuff where I know, like, let's say I go hunt somewhere. If I go on, if I do a DIY hunt or if I'm somewhere and I have to, you know, let's say I book, like you and I went out to Montana one time together, you know, we paid a trespass fee. It was all on our own. We go out there. Well, you get in some of this stuff where it's tight and there's twigs and there's like uh, a lot of like thorn thickets and stuff like that. Yeah. I normally have a sever in my quiver because that thing is as compact as it gets. And yeah. sometimes I'm just like, okay, even if this thing might get an inch less penetration, I know it's going through into the cavity. I know it's yeah. like, I know it's doing what it's going to have to do by the time it stops. But I also yeah. know that I have way less surface area to contact a branch. And I feel yeah. like, I feel like when I look back, I've been going back through, <laughs> when I go back through my footage and look at, you know, honestly, all these different times where I've missed, a lot of my misses come from, from deflections, a limb mm -hmm. I didn't see or you know, yeah. grass, canola, um, you know, so I, I, I know in a hunting situation and, and you've seen it, like the ability to thread a needle, like yeah. that has to be an option. It, otherwise yeah, it you're does. just going to say, I saw the, I saw the mule deer of my life <laughs> or you're like freaking somehow Dudley got an arrow into that thing. Like that's, yeah. that's normally what we would say. And I remember when we hunted together, um, we were doing a lot of, I mean, we only shot broadheads at a hundred yards out, out at the yeah, Eastern thing. I mean, that's much. like all yeah. we did. And we went with broadheads that gave us accuracy, you know, yeah, and, sure. and, and there was a trade-off. It was like, you know, I think at the time we shot strikers like a whole year because how freaking good those shot strikers, um, whack -ums. whack ums. Yeah. Even though were, the blade you know, system good. wasn't necessarily like, I didn't like you know, the blade, how, like, it didn't seem like it had a, a like, super tight pocket to go in. Remember, they were kind of, like, the yeah. blades were just kind of in there, and we're like, you know what? Wouldn't fit real good, but... By the time this out. thing hits the animal, like, the damage is done, you know? Yeah, for sure. What's your thoughts on um, the need of a pass-through? I, I like to have two holes, um, just because obviously it's twice as much blood um especially if you're shooting from an elevated um shot position you know if you have a hole up high and you don't get that bottom hole to really let that blood out it, they can go a long ways before you start start seeing you know that evidence of your hit on the ground you know with that blood so it can put a little more uh pressure on you as a tracker not having two holes so i try to i try to shoot a you know a heavier set up just to promote that penetration as much as possible right um but i don't go you know it's not the most important thing you know i want to i want to drive a big hole and if i have to take a shot on an animal that's maybe not the perfect angle i still want to drive that arrow as far as possible through those vitals and you know get to the business you know even if i have to you know if i have to shoot an antelope quartering on or something like that i want to be able to do that and you know or you know, shoot an expandable on a moose, which I did last year. You know, I did too. Too New Brunswick, and you know, drove that sucker through a you know rib sideways, and it did the job. You know, it didn't blow all the way through, uh, just because it hit so much rib bone on the way in. But yeah, it, you know, that moose didn't go fifty yards. So. Yeah, I I just don't think I think when an arrow is sticking out of something and it's and it piles up. I mean, I don't, I, there's nothing about me that says, oh, didn't pass through. I'm just like, that <laughs> thing's dead. Like, oh, it's yeah. just freaking <laughs> three, two, one, <laughs> you know, here it goes. Yeah. Um, I, I really feel like, I really feel like people need to understand that there's pros and cons to like pass throughs. 
it, it, in my opinion, my opinion, what you just said about the elevated position, that's a great, a hundred percent. That's a great analogy of when that will be important because yeah, if you have an arrow that just sticks in, doesn't go all the way through and it's high, then you're literally going to be tracking hoof prints or, you know, tear outs until, until you find the spot where that, you know, like a whale, it's like that blood fills to the point where the pressure starts shooting that out of that one hold position. But yeah. I guess in saying that, most elevated shot positions are not going to be at a great distance. Exactly. You know? So you're not losing a lot of energy out of, out of that place. And truthfully, a well-placed shot, you know, especially like from a tree stand, like in a whitetail situation, when you lodge that thing into them like that, they don't go as far before they stop. You know, when, when they're freaking hurting like that, um, yeah. for me, my track jobs have been less with a non pass through because they're freaking messed up. You know, you've oh, literally yeah. like thrown a spear into someone and they, they go as far as they can to feel like you can't shoot them again. And then they're just like, is this bad? Is this, <laughs> is this, this bad? feels really bad. <laughs> is this bad? Is this bad? Yeah. Like, you know, that's, that's yeah. for me that helps my recovery. So I kind of say like, listen, I'm looking at it from an optimistic point of view. You know, there are several whitetails and when I'm shooting whitetails, I'm literally looking at the offside leg. And ideally yeah. if I can jam hit that sucker, if yeah. I can hit the offside knuckle and literally break that offside leg and this arrow's sticking halfway out of it. And that thing is, peg legging it to try to evacuate and by then it's just over so i do the same thing i aim for that offside leg typically and i'm not so concerned about a pass through as just you know having the perfect angle through those vitals and make you're gonna find them if you if you do that i mean yeah it, it you know that's just it's happening do you think um if do you think people should focus on the speed of their arrow or the weight of it? Uh, I think there's a little bit of both that goes into that equation, just depending on, you know, obviously if, if you've got a draw link like you do, you know, you can focus <laughs> I can more. do whatever I want. You can do whatever you want. You know, and Zach's in that boat too. He's got a 31 inch draw. And so, you know, but if you've got a 27 inch draw or, you know, 26 and a half, 26, um, you've got to think about it a little bit more. Um, so I think, I think everybody should shoot a, a, an arrow with a decent mass weight that's going to penetrate well. Um, What's your minimum for a, for, a, for someone shooting? Okay, let's, let's say someone, a guy shooting 60 pounds. What do you say? I wouldn't want him really shooting under about 375 or 400 grains. Right. You know, depending yeah. on what he's going after. I'm just thinking whitetail, you know, as a, as a general base case, but. 375 to 400 grains is is a pretty realistic minimum i think um you're gonna have plenty of speed out of a setup like that to to uh, have a reasonable trajectory um but you know if it was me and, and i had a 26 inch draw or something like that and shooting and i could only shoot 60 pounds comfortably and accurately i'd probably want to be closer to 450 you know, to just kind of get a little more speed, but still have a heavier arrow since I am shooting slower than what you and I currently do. Um, I'd still want that heavier mass weight to kind of aid in that penetration. You know, I, I don't want to be at either extreme. I just kind of want to be in that, that middle zone. And, and I want to shoot a, a combined point weight. That's, that's going to shoot really well with my broadheads and my field points. Do you feel like 450 to 550? I've never thought of it this way. I'm just now thinking of it. Do you think like 450 to 550 is another like kind of minimum? That's a sweet spot. That's like a sweet spot to where yeah. like, okay, let's say for those of you watching the video version of this podcast right now, I'm kind of holding my hands a foot apart. So let's say, the bottom third of that could be people that are shooting 27, 28 inch draw. The middle part mm -hmm. of that people that are getting, you know, upper fours to, to lower fives, you guys could mm -hmm. be people that are 29, 30 inch draws. And then 
people, at, but, but here's the thing for those of you who are in the 29 inch draw and the 30 inch draw for sure, if you're the ones that have now said, okay, I'm going to actually shoot a 75 pound bow or I'm going to shoot an 80 pound bow. Well, that bumps you up. That yeah. like moves you up where now. Now you're talking, you can definitely be shooting, um, a 500 grain arrow, like honestly oh, yeah. anywhere in the fives i think you're still going to have a really awesome setup but yep. you know hey what was i'm trying to think um so was ulmer always shooting 440 or 470 what was his I arrow say it was i want to say it was around that 470 mark okay yeah yeah i want to think it was too because uh so like back on our very first DVD, um, Darren's like Darren's little like who he was like sidebar on Darren Cooper. It said, this is the guy who tunes Randy Ulmer's bows or <laughs> um, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It was something like that. So I thought, yeah, cause you're shooting at least at the time he loved the injections and he also loved yeah. the four millimeter FMJs and he was yeah. shooting Ulmer edges. Mm -hmm. So you guys should be pretty damn close in what you're shooting. So yeah, if I was shooting an AC injection, I would probably be in that 480, 470 range. Okay. Right so okay. You know, with FMJ, it's heavier. Yeah. And I mean, arguably Ulmer's gotta be one of the top five bow hunters of all time, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd argue with you if you said different. So I'm sure there's plenty of other guys that are worthy of mention, but yeah, Randy'd be in the conversation for anybody that knows him. So I stick to five millimeter. I also like six. Um, and the reason I like, well, I'll tell you. So the reason I don't shoot a four, if I didn't like and feel that there was a real purpose in bow hunting for a lighted knock, then I mm -hmm. would shoot a four millimeter option. But the knock, any lit knock on a four millimeter arrow shaft is pretty, pretty pliable. Flimsy. And, I, and I feel like at, at 31 inches, 75 pounds, 80 pounds, I can literally take the, those knocks out and put the factory knock in there. And my groups are like half the size. Yeah. just like that i mean yeah. you know and and i keep trying it you know i go back <laughs> i feel a new knock and i'm like okay i'm gonna shoot them and i shoot them and they're listen they're okay like most hunters would probably shoot them and say well I, damn i'd be different. happy with that yeah. but then when you put in another product and all of a sudden you're like well wait a minute why am i not shooting this yeah. you know why am i you know why do I have to shoot that when now I'm shooting this? So, um, that's why I don't shoot the fours. What I love about all these knock manufacturers, they fit the fives without any type of a bushing system. So one of the things that I learned, um, and this, this goes like way back to like even the, the beam and diva C and diva S days, um, outserts and collars, and carbon are two things that have the ability to have poor tolerance at times. Mm -hmm. So I just don't like is as least amount of fittings as I can have. Sure. The cleaner and the better I feel like that projectile is going to be. So with the five millimeter, I love the fact that almost every knock lit knock I can just put into the back of it. Yeah. And I That's love, cool. and honestly, I love the straightness of the match grade FMJs and match grade axis. Um, I feel like, you know, when people are talking about the process that they're going through of like weighing and floating and everything on like those two, sh like if you buy those two yeah. shafts, I'm telling people yeah. like, listen, you may Don't have a me. arrow that might be a flyer. If you number your arrows and if you all of a sudden see like number four, flies out a few times turn the knock 90 change your knock yeah, yeah turn the knock 90 degrees change the knock but like dude you didn't have to do that for the other 11 and honestly oh, it would be yeah. probably more like one out of 36 that you're probably going to ever see that from so yeah. you know you've you've been time. to easton i did a video on on you know on like 
the knock on axis and the knock on FMJs, you know, they have to reload brand new spools for any of those runs. So mm -hmm. every one of our batch runs of an axis or an FMJ is a three mile freaking one thousandths or better arrow that is cut every 33 inches. Like yeah. people listen, we all like Darren and I, and just a hundred other target archers that are world class, world level people. Like these are all things that we've we have spent time with. But once you realize the importance of when you spend money on a factory that's doing that for you in a match grade system, you're not needing to do that. That's wasted time of when you should be practicing. You should be focusing on bow grip. Yeah. You should be focusing on quality of your release. Um, you know, your shot execution, there is way more important places to be spending your valuable time instead of like double checking a match grade arrow. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, uh, you know, spending just a little more money on a quality arrow too, from the get go is, is, you know, I see a lot of guys that man, they're so expensive though. And it's just like, you don't know how much frustration costs, dude. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, just. Yeah. You're like, going on a $5,000 uh, elk hunt and you don't know if one of your 4,000s or worse arrows that you've got in your quiver, like you don't know where that yeah. thing's going to hit, especially when you do want to shoot a fixed blade head and you've put one on there, but you're not wanting to dull that thing. Cause that thing's 30 bucks. So then you're just like, it says it hits like a field point. I'm just going yeah. for it. Next thing you know, you're like, why am I so far back? Yeah. I don't know why I hit him in the neck. I must've hit something. You know, it's like, no man, that you, you, that's just a recipe for disaster. You know, a low quality arrow, low quality broadhead that you've put together in, in hopes that they go to the middle, even yeah. if it's extreme FOC that there's no guarantee, you know, that that happens sometimes even yeah. worse. There's nothing more frustrating than not having a shooting system that will repeat. If you don't have a system that will repeat, you don't know where to start. You don't know what's wrong. And, and it just, man, I've seen guys tearing their hair out and I'll just be like, let me tune your bow with one of my arrows. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, consistency. Hey, we have something to work with. Put those in the trash. Yeah. Let's start over with this, you know, or, or sometimes it's just like, when's the last time you changed your knocks out, dude? <laughs> I would put all, you know, reach in a drawer, grab a bunch of knocks, screw them in, and all of a sudden, hey, consistency's back. So it's not just, you know, like, hey, this is the only, these are the only arrows on the planet that will shoot, but, you know, just you got to have something that you can work with that does the same thing every time it comes out of your bow as a starting point. And if yeah. you don't have that, then, um, you know, me and bother. cousins, yeah, me and cousins would show up to an event and, I'll guarantee you we showed up to an event with brand new freaking pins and brand new freaking knocks and official practice day is, you know, putting 12 reps through every single one of those and having some fresh freaking knocks for an event and some fresh pins. Yeah. Uh, and then I learned every... that the hard way, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we, all we all have probably did at some point, but yeah, that's, that's just, yeah. Starting point. So if you had someone, what, if you had someone and you were going to just get them dialed in and you were going to get a bow for them that you were going to just freaking Darren Cooper, super tune, mm -hmm. what would be the process? Um, I would start by, you know, obviously getting the right spine of arrow and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, eyeball the bow, get the rest. Where would you up. start for spine? Um, what give me a give me a bow to start with okay know, let's go me. with a a person that's shooting a 28 and a half 70 28 and a half 70 i'm gonna probably put him in a 340 yeah was, me on, too yeah yeah something on the stiffer side of what the chart's gonna tell you the right. chart might tell you you could get away with a 400 there but probably a 340 um for that guy we're gonna put 150 grains in the front total combined point weight um and then I'm going to shoot bare shafts out of it through paper first and make sure that, you know, I can get a perfect pinhole from one foot to seven yards. Once okay. I've got that, then we're going to 
shoot some flat shafts through it and make sure that we've got perfect clearance and I'm still getting that dark pinhole with three nice cuts through it. So you're going to shoot a bear outside. shaft. You'll shoot a bear shaft before, before a fletched arrow. As, as my first tuning step. I mean, yeah, I mean, we'll, we might tune it with, with, but yeah, I'm going to shoot the bear shaft first to make okay. sure I've got absolutely perfect flight with no fletching, um, you know, factors. So and then once are, I've got that, we're going to make sure that that on, fletch I'm, shaft. Will I'm asking questions because I value <laughs> yeah. your opinion. Right. I value your opinion. So when you're doing that, what are you doing sure. for the weight on the rear of the shaft? Are you just wrapping tape on the I don't care. I don't care. Do you even worry about it? No. Like on that initial thing? No. So what are you, are you, you're really I'm just, just, I'm getting a, I, that's an initial step. So once I right. get that pinhole through there, I know that the bow is tunable perfectly. Yeah. And then we'll add the, the veins and make sure that we can get similar results. So I'm not getting serious about it until we get the veins on it, but that's the first step of just getting an absolutely perfect, you know, center shot setting and, you know, knock height setting on there. Okay. What if you, what if you don't get that? Are you changing arrow shafts? Um, like let's say you let's say you're getting a let's say you're getting a left tear. Um, and probably going to go through some other tuning steps, like you know maybe some yoke tuning or you know something like that. If it's if it's still you know if I get out of a range of where I want to keep that center shot, then yeah, we're going to look at some different spines. You know we're going to okay. go stiffer if I'm getting a left tear. Um, you know, so we're going to try some different spines or maybe even just a different knock fit. You know, we might work with the serving diameter and make sure that that sucker's snapping on there. Um, nice, but not too freaking tight, not too loose. You know, you that's actually my next, serving. that's my <laughs> next video in this whole like arrow series. Yeah. Uh, the next arrow, is, the next video is going to be, you know, forget, forget the points, forget everything other than this snap could be the most important sound you hear for your accuracy is this snap yeah knock quality and condition and fit is way more important than anything else on that shaft you can shoot a bent shaft with a perfect knock that will repeat over and over and over and probably shoot in the group pretty good with your with your straight ones but if that knock is tweaked, dude, you might shoot your buddy's target. <laughs> I have. You know, or, or the bail over if you've got a knock. In Arizona, down. I have. Aiming yeah. at my bail, but not because yeah. of the bent arrow. It was because of the freaking yeah. tornadoes that were going through there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Remember I, that? I almost shot one that was rolling by. During dude, that the was my storm. target. I was asking. <laughs> I was at full draw, and I'm like, do I have to shoot this thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one. We got some good windstorms out there, man. <laughs> Learn to shoot in a hurricane. Okay, so you go, you you check bear shaft, uh, then you go straight to paper. Yeah, I'm surprised you wouldn't check clearance well, first. Shoot, I would check clearance first. I would, well, I would check the, clearance first, but that's just me. I'm just a, I pretty much use the same rest, you know, over yeah. and over. So I pretty much know I'm going to get clearance. What do you, you use? Know? Um, I've been shooting the, like the AAE pro drops primarily. Oh, wow. But, okay, um, cool. Yeah. Um, I've used those for years and years. And then lately I've been shooting more of the, uh, what's the, the weight quick tune that you just QAD. up with your phone. Yeah. The QAD. And those have been working pretty good for me. I don't think they're as tunable, um, but they're sure simple and, you know, fairly reliable. So, yeah. 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 Do you yeah. ever have any issues with, with that pro drop, I've I've never wanted a a launcher system that I can bend around. That's just always weirded me out. Um, I don't. I think I've bent one once, but I always have you know a spare with me. Okay. Um, so maybe one time, you know, I got in some tangled up in some brush and bent one, but yeah, I had a spare. But it is a it is a concern. I just I just like the fact that there's a little bit of you know, cushion, you know, like a target blade almost with that rest. Yeah. I think it's a little more forgiving in some regards. You know what I do on mine is, uh, so if you see my rest, I don't know if you can see yeah. it. 
Yeah. So what I do on mine is um, I've got like different size steel rods that mm -hmm. are five millimeter, six millimeter, and I'll heat it up on a, on a torch and then I just, I'll lay it in there. That's so cool. can you see how that's like oh, yeah. perfectly a concave yeah. little trough in there? That's cool. Yeah, I've done that. And a lot of people like get hypersensitive about like <laughs> sound on the rest. But honestly, like, unless you're drawn back like a, like a full spaz, like I've, <laughs> I feel like, you know, you want a smooth draw cycle anyway, just for limited movement. I, I honestly can get away. I've hunted all year without, you know, without anything on there. Some people get super weirded out about that, but I don't yeah, like I mean, anything that can change. I don't, yeah, I've just yeah, never wanted to I be agree. able to wear through it as I'm practicing and my knocks getting low or my knock heights raising because I'm wearing through that. That's just me personally. Um, yeah, no, I, I get it. I, I still usually do put, in fact, I'm looking at a picture on my other screen of a of my bow and I've got that same rest on this bow and I've got felt on, on it. So I usually do run it. Just, it seems like if, if I'm in a high humidity or a rainy situation, sometimes I'll get a little bit of chatter or yeah. noise on there. But I do hate the fact that it, it does wear and change a little over time. So it's something you got to keep an eye on. And and uh, you, will, you will eventually see yourself shooting low. I mean, there's <laughs> yeah, no doubt yeah. about it. You know, it's yeah. something you have to – it's a maintenance item that you have to keep track of when you're shooting a felt or, you know, whatever, shrink tube. Yeah, anything even the plastic wearable. will wear, you know. So right. So okay, you so then you check. Uh, you'll check with paper with the fletched arrow. Um, yeah. Assuming that you're still, I mean, if you're getting that tear with a bear shaft, the likelihood of you not getting that tear or not getting a good tear with with veins would be pretty Just minimal, contact. unless unless it's too high of a vein where you're contacting you know, a yeah. cable rod. I did a, I did a uh, thing the other day, the amount of people that have a rest like this, and then, you mm -hmm. know, they're trying to shoot longer yardage. So they're trying to vo avoid their scope housing and they just turn their arrow upside down. I'm like, dude, with check? a full size blazer <laughs> vein, you're, you're just hitting you're the bottom now. <laughs> or yeah. honestly on a Matthews, the, if you're caught, like you, you have more worry about your cock vein on the inside cable yeah. of a matthews then anything you should do with your arrow you should be focusing on turning indexing that knock to where yeah when you're looking behind your string your your top vein should be at about 130 yeah. so that I your bottom vein tree. is like this you have to do that with a hoyt like you have or with a matthews yeah, it has to yeah. be like this if you go straight up and down like this this thing stands a chance of contact. Your bottom one for sure is going to hit the bottom of that, even if it's slight, but that's, what's going to cause that yeah. slight porpoising. So yeah, yeah. like, so I'm going to hit, I don't know what you thing. use. Do you use like a tenactin spray on powder to check for contact on stuff? I mean, I just turn, I look down the back of it. I mean, if, if it's, if it's within a few millimeters and the first, this is the first time this person's grabbed the bow. Um, yeah. and honestly, that's why like on our arrow builds, that's why we're using like a four fletch max stealth because that thing's long and low profile. In. You run it like an X, you have the best clearance possible on cables, scope, and a plethora yeah. of different arrow rests. Yeah, no, that's good advice. Yeah. So my buddy, I was helping him tune his Creed the other day. His Matthew's Creed is an older bow, but, um, nice setup still. And I could tell just looking at his veins that he had a little bit of contact, but it was, it was just hard to figure out where. And so what I do is I, you know, I spray the veins with some tenactin like foot powder right. and then the rest and stuff too. And then shoot it, not through paper or anything. Cause you don't obviously don't want the veins hitting the paper and knocking the, the powder off, but it'll show you exactly where, you know, things are touching. And so we had to, you know, tweak that angle of his veins and uh, get everything to clear good. And then all of a sudden, hey, we're getting consistent tuning results now. And it was pretty easy to dial this stuff in after that. But yeah, that's that's step number two is just make sure veins are totally clearing and doing exactly what that that you know other shaft is penciling through the paper. I want the same tear with just three cuts. So okay. 
All right. Then what, then what's next after that? After that, we're going to go shoot it and, um, uh, you know, see how it's grouping at long range. And, and, um, it's pretty rare when a bow set up like that, that's going to, that's going to shoot a, a perfect bullet from one foot to seven yards. It's re- exceedingly rare that those, you know, it won't shoot a broadhead with the field point at, at distance. So, yeah. Other than maybe a little bit of height difference, if you know, because there's a little more drag on the broadhead, but yeah, uh, that I would expect to see. But other than that, you know, usually you get really good tune. If not, then you can play a little bit with center shot. You know, if you're seeing some left and right, you probably have a little room to tweak that center shot, but generally, um, you know, that's all you need to do. If there's more than that, then you know, there's you can get into some more tweaking and whatnot, try some different things, but. Um, nine, nine and a half out of 10 times. That's, that's about all I need to do to, to get a bow to shoot really, really good. And then if it doesn't, or if it does for you and then it doesn't for them, the, at least in my opinion, the first thing that you got to start thinking about is that person's front hand position or facial pressure. Absolutely. And usually you'll pick that up when you're tuning because (laughs) they'll shoot one bullet hole and then, you know, all right, that, did you get lucky or, you know, we're going to try it again. And if I start seeing some variation on how they're tearing through the paper, then we're going to step back and work on some of those things. Are you yeah. changing pressure on your face? Is your hand doing the same thing? And, it, and usually I can watch them shoot and see what that front hand's doing. But um, I've seen some guys make some breakthroughs just at the tuning rack going, all right, well, it should be doing the same thing every time. And it's not. So let's you know get to the bottom yeah. of this work through some hunt, front hand pressure things and teach them how to really relax that and all of a sudden it's like you know boom their groups shrink in half and you know their aim gets much better i mean there's just so much in that front hand darren are there any things in the industry right now that you feel like topics that you feel like we're divided on that's that's taking away from a direction that we could be going in an industry? Do you feel like there's not, not specific to arrows? I'm just saying in general, are there like coaching techniques and stuff that you feel like you wish we weren't arguing about? I have a few topics, but I'm (laughs) curious if you do. Yeah. You're probably more into that than I am. I don't, you know, I don't pay that much attention anymore to what other people are saying. Cause I just, I don't, you know, I, don't, I, don't, don't I post time. it, I post and ghost most of the, most of the time. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, you know, I can't say for sure, you know, what people are doing out there. I know that the FOC thing I've seen so much on lately though, that was when you made a, a post the other day about, you know, and you were shooting a long range group and, and uh, you said, I don't remember something about, you know, point wave or veins or something like that. It's just like, yeah, forget about all the little tests you're doing, man. Just shoot a setup that works and practice. Yeah. And and I got on board and I'm like hundred percent truth and share it. Cause (laughs) I, that's one thing that I have seen a ton of lately is guys talking about. And I wrote an article a while back. You might be able to find it online is the title was, does it really fletching matter? (laughs) And it was, it was, you know, I spent the time to do a lot of stuff out of a shooting machine, you know, just to take, you know, any of the, you know, human factor out of it and lend a little more credibility. But it was like, you know, there, it doesn't matter, man. It's, yeah. I get a setup with enough drag to stabilize your broadhead and just go shoot and you're going to be miles ahead. Obviously, you don't want to be way too much vein or not enough vein, but. You know, if you're in a, a pretty solid range, it's just, just, it's like the same thing with your point weight, you know, be around that 150 grit. That's my number. And I, I haven't even asked you what you, what your number is for, you know, your total combined point weight. But if, I know if I put a decent, you know, like a four fletch on the back, you know, if I'm going to shoot a, uh, you know, a fixed blade, it might be a little bigger, you know, or a little more helical. Um, but for any mechanical, you know, a, kind of a low profile four fletch and 150 grain point setup. And if it's in the spine range that it should be, you should have a wicked deadly setup. And I you know. Shouldn't waste, I you know. shouldn't waste I'm, your time dinking with the other point weights and different fletching setups and left helical. And it's like, dude, come on. 
Yeah. So what's your, what's how good are you? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the hard thing for me too, is like people roll up on my target and then they'll go into these big debates with me. And I'm just like, bro, I've stood here and shot this dot in front of 150 groups this weekend, you know, and, and I don't always hit it, but I also know that most of the people that are arguing with me are not <laughs> shooting closer to me. And I'm just like, dude, and I always just say, like, are you arguing with me when I'm closer to center? And then, you know, <laughs> normally their buddies are just like, oh, but it's true. You know, that's the thing. It's like I've shot I grew up shooting with people like you and cousins. And uh, it's just like. There's people like there's some of us that. Probably sh like I feel like the shooting machine is a big waste of my time. Like. I, I like when my bow breaks, I've got a 90% chance to where I can tell you where that freaking thing's going. And I also like doing tests that do involve some mechanical error ability. Sure. You know, hopefully it's not magnified, you know, hopefully my hand variation, which is why these tests I've been doing, I'm just like, you know what, if I just shoot live uncut, like it's going to, this is real. Like, yeah, you can have a lot of dog shit stuff out of a shooting machine that will still be repetitive. It's just repetitive dog shit. Yeah, you need something that has forgiveness. So the shooting machine for me is more of if you're collecting data for speed or penetration. I feel like a shooting machine is a valuable tool for that. But when you're checking groups, I feel like having especially if you have an elite level shooter, you know, there's probably a hundred, I don't know, maybe a hundred people I know of that are, you know, fantastic shooters, maybe 20 of those hundred that are still the same in pressure situations. And then maybe 10 that are at an elite level, you know, which is, I think where we used to be, you know, yeah. I, me at 47 and not giving a shit. If I get a freaking check, <laughs> I'd be trying to figure out how to get an early flight home, dude, to get in my pool. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't have the, the drive or the, you know, time anymore to, to do it at that level. It's a, it's a, it's a job. And yeah, to, for sure. So well, but so, I loved it. So I one of the I things I like still, <laughs> yeah, one of the things I liked about the six millimeter. So I talked about the FMJ and Axis earlier. I like mm -hmm. how the knock fits in the six or in the five. The knock mm -hmm. will fit directly in the five. But what I really like about the six is once you get to a six millimeter, you have the ability to make a much thinner wall. And you also have a bushing system that now is more like not an internal system where you where you have yeah. the risk of tear out. So that 75 grain in the front of these like Sonic KEs that we have, you mm -hmm. know, I tell people, I'm like, listen, you can shoot a 250 Sonic 250 spine, which will let you go up to 80 pounds. You can put a 75 grain insert in it, a hundred grain head. And that arrow with a lighted knock is like 509 grains at my length. That's a freaking damn good setup. I mean, yeah. that's a damn good setup for 200 bucks and they're freaking straight as hell. The consistency is yeah. awesome. You do have the FOC that some of the FOC you're chasing, but you also have an arrow that's freaking going to shoot flat and keep your pins tight. You know, that's the little yeah. test I did yesterday. I'm like, listen, guys, what do you want your pin gaps to be? Do you want them like this or do you want them like, you know, like, freaking west side like freaking, <laughs> you know what i mean like there's people with pins four pin side that like go. takes up their whole freaking thing yeah you know or it kills me when i see people that are like with this high foc arrow my 40 to 50 is can it's tighter because it's retaining energy oh. at longer distance i'm like dude no, you don't not. know how to center your shit up that has yeah. nothing is de yeah. definitely not gaining energy down yeah. range like without yeah. a doubt not happening yeah that's that's called not centering the peep properly <laughs> that's well that's, that's a good top that's a good topic for you so you used to always center your pin 
in yeah. the center of your peep, even on a multi. So you and I were like yeah. polar opposite in how we did that. Yeah. Are you still that way? I have uh, probably had more setups in the last 15 years that I centered the housing on just because um, I wanted a bigger peep mainly. And there I think when you get to oh, a certain right. peep, when you get to a certain peep diameter, um, it gets a lot harder to center an individual pin accurately. And I just think it made more sense to center the housing there. But I think last year I went back to kind of a moderately sized uh, peep and I was centering the pins again. I just felt like I was shooting a little bit better that way. Hmm. So, I never can. I, I like, I have to have the same exact picture at six o'clock on my bubble. Yeah. Um, you know, I did a podcast with James Park. Did you ever meet James? I don't think so. Um, so, uh, he's been doing a, he's actually writing a paper on, um, four things that make you miss, um, in archery. And mm -hmm. one of the leading things is the canting of the bow. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just the people's ability to pay attention to their bubble. And that's why like some of these sites where the bubbles all the way at the top, like I just tell people that that's a hard place to like, look at a level, look at a pin, approach a target properly, trust yeah. a float while still trying to like, because if you're using a longer distance and you're having to look from the bottom of a housing to the top at the longer distance, that's where it matters even more. So you're kind yeah, of moving sure. your ability for an error further away from a focal point. So I feel like for me, I really love taking the bottom edge of my peep and literally touching, you know, the bottom part of that level. You know, if all of a sudden my level's going away, I know that I'm, you know, smashing in too deep. If all right. if the longer distance all of a sudden I've got like I can see the I can start to see that white ring. Well now I know I'm gonna hit freaking two yards low, you know? Yeah. Um so that that's how I do it. That's kind of what I found to help me be more accurate. Yeah. And I've, you know, I've, I've had really good luck centering the housing too. It's just, yeah, I, but I definitely used to be. Well, you used to shoot a, like time. damn near a target peep, dude. Yeah. Smaller peep. I could just shoot it so good. And that was what I was used to, but it, it, um, there's definitely times, you know, bear hunting and things like that, where you're, you're always going to be shooting in low light. I mean, right. most of your white tail encounters still are at low light. Um, so it's, it's pretty critical to have a bigger peep to just be able to, sh you know, use all of your, um, available shooting light. Right. Um, all right. Well, I've got another question. So I had a, I actually had a pretty cool, uh, text yesterday from T-Bone. T-Bone sent me a thing, just said like, Hey dude, I, you know, this video series is freaking cool. Just so you know, there's, I'm totally on board with you on a lot of the topics. And he's like, some I'm not. But, you know, for the most part, I like, I love what you're saying. And so I, you know, I value T-Bone's opinion. So I told him, yeah. I'm like, I go, dude, tell me what we disagree on, you know? And, and he's just like, no, it's cool. And I told him, <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm genuinely interested. Um, you know, let me know what's going on. So, um, and he, had, he totally has a valid point and this is a good topic. So he just told me, he said, He's like, I personally don't focus on FOC, but I also like an arrow that has some. And he's like, so I'm just not an advocate of the extra weight of a vinyl wrap or a four fletch. I would rather use that weight for my lighted knock to keep the mm -hmm. equation as good as possible. And I said, hey, dude, a hundred percent. Like, I agree with you. I said, but, but then I told him, I said, here's why I've gone, I've settled on the four fletch i told him i said in years of looking back through footage i said what i found is that a lot of the animals i've missed or animals that end up getting wounded normally because of a string you know a string jumping i said anytime the bow goes off and the animal just like casually is like looking to like what's that sound I said, anytime I can see on video, their, their eyes locate the sound of an inbound projectile. At that time, you've turned them into a fully freaking level 10 berserker string jumper. <laughs> yeah. So like on antelope, you know, when that bow goes off, 
you know, it, a lot of times they're like looking, but if, if they like, if their head turns and then their eyes go up and they're hearing this thing coming in, well, now you're in a horrible position because, you know, they can freaking jump through their own buttholes, you know, if, oh, yeah. if need be. So I just told them, I'm like, um, I actually sent them a picture of like a sound chamber for, you mm -hmm. know, what we had used for testing uh fletchings and i just said i've personally found that the four fletch in this configuration is as quiet as i can make and i said so i want the second audible to be non-relevant like i don't like a broadhead that's vented that is a broadhead's sucking air and like yeah. you know acting like a miniature deer whistle coming in oh yeah i don't want anything like that i feel like with three fletches or especially like so I posted that picture of like that year, I think it was like one, that Alpha Max. I know I had mine like a year early with you, but mm -hmm. it was that year where I had the Alpha Max and then McNail was sending me all those arrows to test for what type of pre-fletch Easton was going to offer. So it was like all those different, you know, spines and shafts right. and everything that I was plotting. And so what I found, what I found was and I won't mention the brand, but a, sh a short, very high profile vein that was very high profile right now. They're arguably a little bit risky on some of, uh, these new cable rods. They're pretty risky. Mm -hmm. And even some of those, even some of the, uh, some of the arrow rests out there have, even though they are limb driven, they're, they're out of the way. Oh, yeah. they're, they're, still, tight. they're tight. Like people really listen, tight. they're really, really tight. And what I found was that vein had noise to it, even though it had very good productivity when it came to how things were grouping. Yeah. And so what I did to try to get rid of the sound was where that, the that tip of the point was at. I know. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> so I would nip that off with a pair of yeah. um, fingernail clippers yeah. and the sound would change, but man, the performance would change too. Yeah. So, and honestly, that was, the reason why I went down the whole process with Norway to develop the fusion vein, just so mm -hmm. that that thing was rounded and tapered down. So, you know, my whole project with the fusion vein was for that. And then, you know, and honestly, I loved the very first AAEs that are the same shape as what we offer now, but the very first one, you know, what were they called? What were the very first, were they called Plastifletch? Like the first ones that were kind of, remember they were more like, were they elites or something? They were floppier. They were like, the yeah, easiest, just to glue on, like it was the easiest glue and vein in history. But oh, yeah. if you shot through something, they were just done. Oh, yeah, um, they were smoked. But once, gun out. yeah, but once the hybrids came out or the Max Stealth are the, definitely mm -hmm. the most durable and the most quiet because it's not, you know, it's not wavering. Um, I just told him, I'm like, for me, the sound is a big play. And I said, so I've, I'm willing to sacrifice half a percent of FOC for that. And I told him too, and I said, in regards to the wraps, dude, like veins cure easier, you yeah. know, it seems like the adhesion's better. You don't have to rough up the shaft where it kind of looks bad sure. when someone gets a brand new arrow. So I just told him like, from a from a business and audible point of view that's why you know i'm i feel like we're finding a great middle ground to where the performance can still be the same and so he just yeah. said he's like yeah dude i get it i'm just telling you this is why i don't do that stuff so yeah there's one other argument for three fletch and that's just um when you are shooting groups at distance it's just one less vein to hit <laughs> and no, nobody likes fletching arrows that much. So, um, you know, there's that, you know, what else so. I told them to, um, so I had three reasons. And the third reason, um, is because what I found with a fixed blade head with a fixed blade head and a, and a three blade or a three vein arrow, your, your broadhead vein alignment certainly affects accuracy, especially uh -huh. if your tune isn't flawless. Like if you're, if you're a nine out of 10 in tune vein blade indexing definitely is going to be a factor with four. I don't feel like that has to be a factor. I feel like that thing is like 
turning a wind foil, the broadhead is, you know, following that. And I feel like for whatever reason, I can shoot a more of a range of types of broadheads with four fletches versus three and not have to be sitting there and sanding them and aligning them and tuning them. Yeah. I think I've seen that myself enough to, yeah, I agree. So that's pretty, I mean, that's pretty cool. What vein are you shooting? I think I'm shooting the max stealth. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting indeed. Well, so one thing I was going to, um, one thing I was going to say that I hate seeing a divide and actually I've talked to a few of our good friends that had an opinion one way, uh, a year ago, and now they're kind of changing their tune just because of how shitty it is to draw tags. So I was like, Oh, for 10 for tags. So I've got to like, I've got to buy, like, I'm like looking for landowners or last minute cancellations to fill my September up. Um, yeah. but one of the things I hated as a divide as a community was the whole, you know, public land, private land thing. I've never liked that. Um, just because there's going to come a time where not all of us are going to even draw, you know, you're not going to, you're going to have to hunt some private land or you're going to have to buy a landowner tag if you want to go, you know, if you, yeah. if you want to go. So, For sure. and, and with that kind of ties into, a pretty cool uh, business that you started that I thought was such an awesome idea. Um, so you have a business called rent guns and gear. Actually. So we do have that business, but we also, I'm going to just go like rent, rent outdoor, outdoor gear. gear. You changed it. Okay. Yeah. So we still have rent guns and gear just for renting the guns, the rifles. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, advertising on social media and whatnot with the word guns in the name <laughs> of your company gets to be a cha a challenge that we couldn't necessarily overcome. You know, we were getting blackballed and, you know, we'd get like not enough, not enough, uh, you know, traction with our social media. Yeah. That's a great way to advertise and even Google and stuff. You know, if, if, if there's gun in the word, man, you're going to be at the bottom of the search results. So <laughs> We renamed the company and, and we do most of our equipment under rent outdoor gear uh, at rentoutdoorgear.com. And that's, you know, optics and tripods and backpacks and tents and sleeping bags and kind of all that gear that you need to come out west and, and uh, you know, hunt the, hunt the backcountry. Yeah. So this is really cool for any of you listening. Um, and honestly, like, there's some of us that we do this. We, we love it. We're totally comfortable with it. There's people that'll just throw a bunch of gear in a truck and freaking go out West. But there's also a lot of people East of the Mississippi or a lot of people that are getting into archery because they heard it on a mainstream source. And now they're like, okay, where do I get started? So having the ability to where, let's say you find, you know, let's, let's say you find a hunt and you're going on this hunt or let's say you like booked like land trust, I think is freaking awesome. They actually yeah, just started, cool. they just started, they just started leasing. They actually lease some property here in Iowa too. Um, cool. and I tell people like people are mad. They're like, well, we're going to have to pay to hunt any private land. Well, here, here's like a, a scenario that I've heard multiple times. Um, and I've heard multiple landowners that have came up to their booth and who have like said that this, you know, I would like to look at letting hunters come on my land because of, so here's an example. Uh, one of our neighbors, uh, the two kids, one of our neighbors, uh, being one of the sisters, they inherited a farm that's in a trust can't be sold. Mm -hmm. So they invariably, they, you know, two, two ladies, two daughters, to the dad that passed two daughters inherit a farm that's in a trust that can't be sold but the property taxes are seven thousand bucks a year on yeah. this farm and neither one of them are in a final a financial position to pay for that thing so this is like the perfect scenario of here's a private farm in iowa that a deer hunter a local hunter or whoever can can pay to play per day on there and and until these people make 
enough money to pay for their property taxes and then they're going to and then they'll cut that off. So I mean yeah. this is like an awesome situation because what's the other what's the other scenario? The other scenario is some you know someone with cash a freaking real estate shark is circling the water waiting for failure of payment on that property and they're going right. to buy it and it's going to become another you know huge you know white tail property or whatever that's going to go to one person not everyone's going to use it it's going to be yeah. freaking locked up so there's certainly like benefits to that and in those situations for someone to be able to like get on your website or call you guys and say Hey, I found an, an Idaho elk tag and I'm going to be going for five days. I've got, um, there is a ranch house there, but there's limited amenities. Uh, right. I don't want to haul all this stuff out there. I've only got a, you know, I've only got a Jeep Wrangler. I mm -hmm. mean, dude, they could freaking like you guys could deliver a turnkey kit to that freaking ranch door. And when they, yeah, up, absolutely. That thing is like, you know, they've got a pair of freaking Swaros sitting there on a tripod and, you know, yeah. any of the other stuff. So tell me sure. what all you guys can do just so people know, uh, you know, what the what that range is and what the limitations are. Um, so it, it, it's it's a pretty easy system. It's it's super simple um, to go book gear. You, you go online. We've got, um, you know, a range of you know, optics and, and backcountry gear, uh, everything from thermal optics to, you know, binoculars, spotting scopes, range finders, range finding binoculars, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's all curated gear that it's not going to be your Cabela's catalog where you have to select from 9,000 options. It's <laughs> only stuff that I would personally take on, you know, similar hunts. Right. Okay. So it's, it's high quality stuff. There's a range of, there's a price range in there. You know, I've got some Vortex and then I've got up to, you know, Swarovski and L Pures on the binocular side, just as an example. Um, but we don't carry the low end, you know, vortex it starts at you know basically a vortex razor or razor uhd um so it's all really good stuff um you're gonna have a good experience with the gear you know we've got exo mountain uh, backpacks and kuyu backpacks kuyu tents seek outside tents we've got the hot tents with titanium stoves um oh damn. we've got down down sleeping bags so you know if you've got an alaska hunt or you know you drew it through a late season tag in Idaho or something like that. And, and you're going to be out here in November, you know, a hot tent and a down zero degree bag is going to be, you know, key. And that's yeah. expensive stuff that you may not use on a year to year basis, especially right. if you live in Texas or in the Midwest or even back East. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't invest your time and money in, you know, spending a month researching, you know, what backpack should I buy? You know how hard that is. And then you're, you know, going through all these online forums, trying to figure that out. We have curated and, you know, got these options to, to really, you know, give you the right stuff without having to do all that work. And, um, it's going to save you so much money. I mean, you can rent a, you know, a nice meat hauling backpack, you know, if you're going elk hunting and you're going to have to haul some meat out of the field, you know, you can rent a backpack like that for, you know, 75 bucks a week. And it's a $700 backpack. Okay. If it works really good for you, you can also buy it. So we'll give you seven days, your rental hundred percent back to where to purchase on all of our gear. So it's not only, you know, are we the only ones that rent this stuff, but we're also, we feel the best way to buy it because nobody else is going to let you take a piece of gear hunting, try it out and see if you like it before you pay for it. And then I'll give you that rental money back. So you're not out anything. It was just like a free trial period. So plus we're going to save you money because it's lightly used gear and you're virtually never going to pay retail for it. So we're always going to save you some money if it's lightly used. It's going to be in primo shape. If it gets beat up, we send it back, get it reverbed, or, you know, we blow them out for super cheap. But yeah, uh, so it's going to be perfect, like new, going to have the warranty and all that. We're dealers for Swarovski, Vortex, Seek Outside, you know, all this gear. So yeah, it's that's such a cool system. Like buying it from the store. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of people that live, you know, that live in, a city, you know, like, uh, like right now we, we just were moving Harry into his apartment, you know, and, yeah. and it's like that, you know, if he decides to go on a hunt, 
Like he's not going to want to be storing a freaking tent and a sleeping bag and all this stuff. If he's got a two bedroom flat, but you know, honestly, for what you could, you could literally show up with the best of the best for a seven day period of time, put it back in a box, ship it back, look like a freaking total baller in all your pictures. (laughs) (laughs) Not only look, but I mean, that gear's better, man. It's going to help you hunt more efficiently and, and you know, you're going to have a better experience in the field. So dude, I remember, uh, I, I went to my 10 year high school reunion. I don't even know why, but I did. <laughs> and this dude was there. He like rolls up in like some freaking sweet ass car, you know, he's got like, <laughs> he's got like a chick with him and everything. And like, he's just talking the talk. Like, you know, I work downtown, like, and we're just sitting there like, dude, this kid was kind of a dork, you know? (laughs) And next thing I know, like we literally shut down this country club where we were. And they like, they pretty much said like my high school party, I wasn't a partier, but my high school for sure, like Cooper would have got along good there. And I remember (laughs) they came out and they're like, Hey, last call for freaking alcohol. Like this is it. And I remember like seeing my classmates, come out of the kitchen area, like just double, double arm and like cases, you know, and I'm just like, gee, and they're just like, I'll take 48, you know, just like, holy smokes. And then when that shut down this slew of drunk skyhawks, we then like went downtown and, and once that closed out, um, and granted you knew me, like you knew me, this would have been 2004 i don't think i was yeah. drinking at that time i know i wasn't actually um because i never drank when i worked for matthews like until i left matthews i just didn't drink you know i drank like once in high school or something so uh i'm just like tagging along with these drunk idiots and i remember going out the back alley to try to just like ghost out at the end of the day and here's this kid like paying this dude and the guy's like I don't give an F dude. You paid me to have my car until midnight. I've been looking for you for three freaking hours, dude. And he's like, we're not done yet. I I just need it like another six hours. And he's like, freaking pay me for another day, dude. And so like this guy like literally rented some Porsche or something from like one of his girls too, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, dude. Like there was no doubt about the girl, but like the car was like, the car made you think like, it's got real plates on it. Like, you know, (laughs) like, but yeah, totally busted, totally busted. Well, listen, dude, uh, is there anything you want to say? Like, I I really valued your opinion and I felt like if you and I talked about this and I didn't know, and I asked, it would be a very good yin and yang to, you know, when I podcasted with James, um, I knew there was topics where I, needed to lead them in and everything. But then with you, I'm yeah. like, I'm just going to ask Darren what's going on. Cause I've always like, you don't show up somewhere slinging dog turds down there. You Like if you show <laughs> up, you're freaking, you're usually yeah, over prepared. Honestly, that was, that's what kept you from being on the podium all the time, dude, is like you freaking overtrained worse than anybody. Probably, I Probably <laughs> dude. Remember <laughs> when we went to go to Sweden for the world's, I think, I think our team trial was in uh, June, right? Yeah, in Washington. Okay, so we had our team trials, and then I think, and then I want to say the worlds were like the end of August or something, weren't they? End of August. I think so, yeah. But there was two and a half months there, and I remember you called me like right at the beginning of August, and you're just, and by then it had been six weeks. And you're just like, yeah, dude, I'm freaking, you know, I've been, uh, you had told me that you had like carried targets out. You'd been freaking setting up unmarked yeah. shots for like freaking two months already. And you're like, you're like, how's your training going? And I go, dude, my freaking bow case hasn't been unpacked since then. And I kind of looked at my watch <laughs> and I'm like, we're about perfect right now. And I said, what are we 21 days out? And you're like, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I'll start training today. Because for me, I always needed about three yeah. weeks. I can, I can polish myself. And I always had this thing about R and R, you know, I'm like, if I take steps away, I come back in really hungry. I come back in hungry and I come back in focused. 
I remember when, when you showed up to, to Sweden and me you and cousins went to that practice range so that we were kind of off the beaten path. You were just like, I'm so burned out from shooting. <laughs> and Mm-hmm. I looked Yeah, at I you beat. and I'm like, dude, like get your shit together. We got a freaking stroke tomorrow at 8 a.m. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I probably almost peaked at the trials that year, but my probably my biggest issue is I would get in this zone where it would be like, you know, blinders on and just going through and I would do something completely stupid, like forget to set a sight or whatever. And I I think do that's that every exact, day. I think that's what I did at, at uh, the world championships. I did it. I shot the wrong target. Um, and I think I missed up my sight and that kept me off the podium there, but Yeah, never had a freaking it. triple podium would have been freaking baller, dude. We had Yeah, it. it would have been killer. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. would have been freaking dope, Yeah. dope sauce Cause I was right there. lights out at, at trials and I know I was shooting good enough at, at the worlds. It just, yeah. Brain fart, you know, Yeah, we, well, burn out. man, that was a freaking, there were some savages back then. I mean, Oh just yeah. straight up freaking savages. <laughs> That's what I tell yeah. people. People were like, how do you, how do you deal with like buck fever or, you know, how did you deal with like, you know, some of your nerves at tournaments? And I'm like, dude, we, our practice sessions were freaking dog fights. They were, man. Um, I mean, we shot some because there wasn't an arrow limit. Like I tell people this in practice, there's no arrow limit. Like there's times where you're just like, first one to miss is buying dinner and you just freaking shoot all day and if you do miss one you're like talking the biggest shit to the guy that's ready to go at full draw and just hoping he cacks one out so he can be back to par start over and that's what happened man so i used to love those practice sessions Yeah, they were fun. Yeah, when Dave was living in Salt Lake, I used to really like training with him indoors, and we would, you know, shoot head to heads a lot, and it raised my game like crazy. I mean, first 30x 300 I ever shot was head to head, head with Dave because I it just forced me to, Well, cause like, you had if to. I miss, if I miss, this dude's beating me, and that's not happening. Yeah. 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 I, I haven't talked to him in so long. I, I made a post the other day about the, the three of us. And I kind of said like, you know, we've, well, we all grew up during punk eras and, and I was more the, I was the non partier of the group. And, you know, I think, uh, At first. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Once, yeah. Once, once I left Matthews and like, and like Hoyt didn't care what I did then. Yeah. Then I was just like, all right, let me, let me try one of these Zimas and see what happens. Whoa, <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> yeah, that was really good. That was really good. I was actually, uh, so we were up at Brighton for TAC and, uh, do you remember that one day we went up and like, we practiced, but Dude, we like went up and like went up somewhere cool in the in the Wasatch to like make some shots. And you had this like, Yeah. I remember saying like, dude, my mouth is drier than a popcorn fart right now. And you're just like, bro, I got some freaking blue mountains in the back seat. And I'm like, what? That was the best taste in Coors freaking Oh I yeah. have ever had. I think I had two, dude, and I was freaking just buzzed hard. <laughs> The mountains are blue Yeah, they at 10,000 were. feet. They were, they were, Wow. you know, I tell people, uh, when people ask me like the best I've ever shot. So the best I've ever shot was that bow that you and Zach built me the time where I had left Matthews, but I didn't like Ho Hoyt didn't really want me in the building yet, but I didn't want to go in Hoyt's building. So I'm just like, I need to, before I make any decisions, I need to know how these bows shoot. So you guys built me two bows. Yeah. You built me that one bow, um, and which I think was a ProTech with 3,500s on it. And like some like miniature spiral cam or something. And it, I mean, it was, it was the best I've ever shot a full FIDA. Like I've, I've remember I've got that face Yeah. and, and what's
I mean, it was it was like it was like a fourteen twenty eight or something stupid. But yeah, I never shot ridiculous. that. Yeah, I never shot that bow again because I don't know. It's almost like it's almost like I was so convinced that I wanted to shoot a Hoyt and I like I wanted like I didn't want any excuse why I wasn't going to go to Hoyt because like part of me wanted to. But I was also on my severance pay. So we, we met at Easton and not at Hoyt. And right. I remember I freaking shot that thing and it was just the one bow. We set it up on the tailgate. Remember? Mm -hmm. I think we built it like it was on your tailgate or Zach's right yeah. by the Eastern fence. And then, uh, went out there and just freaking slung down some of the craziest shit I've seen out of myself. And then I'm just like, <laughs> all right, dude, well, this conversation's over. I'll see you guys in two months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember that. That was nuts. Well, have you ever played with one of these, dude? I haven't. I this thing is freaking awesome, dude. I take a lot of pride in this sucker. This was uh this is yeah. a beast, dude. It's a beast. Um I'm sure. You need to play with one. It's it's surprising. It shoots really good. So well, thanks so much, dude. I'm gonna let you yeah, go man. and uh I want to get cool. this sucker posted up, but let let people know where they can find you, dear. Yeah, let's uh you guys can find us at rentoutdoorgear.com on instagram we're at rent outdoor gear and then and on facebook i think we're at rent hunting gear so and then you can also find me on instagram at, at darren underscore cooper d-a-r-i-n so yeah definitely check out the gear rental like i said we don't just rent it we sell it so if you're in the market i'll even another cool thing that we do just mention real quick but if you're torn between hey do i want to uh like a binocular or a swarovski we can rent them both to you for three days. You can try them both out. I'll give both rentals back toward whichever one you pick. So it's uh, nobody else in the industry does that. You're going to have a great buying experience or rental experience, but it's a, it's a great way to kind of lessen that monetary load to get out West and, and have a really enjoyable hunt uh, with the right gear that you need. So yeah, check us out. Cool, dude. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Darren. I miss you a ton, dude. Yeah, me too, buddy. We need to uh, hook up and do a hunt here soon. Thanks I know. For well, me my on. legs are just as long, bro. You better freaking get your shit <laughs> you together. <know. laughs> I wore you out a few times, but uh, yeah, I was in some yeah. pretty primo shape back then. So. Yeah, you're freaking. The one thing you've got <laughs> is a freaking some hammies and some ass cheeks that freaking don't stop pumping, dude. <laughs> like you got two pistons that just climb nonstop. Yeah. The diesel that could <laughs> <laughs> low and slow dog. You freaking just grind all yeah. day. Yeah, well, I'm thanks buddy. Ground. You're a nightmare though. I hate to keep it up with you. <laughs> all right. See Sounds you. good, buddy. Thank you. Be sure to check out knock on archery.com for our full line of custom designed products as well as free in-depth education and bow hunting entertainment to help you shoot at your best.